Hello to everybody coming in and happy new year, happy 2023. I hope this year is a little easier to say than 2022 because that one always tripped me up. How's everybody doing today? And I'm gonna go ahead and just advance to our first screen so that people who are coming in, um, you can feel free to participate in the chat while we're waiting for uh, more people to show up. But um, what I'd really love to hear this time is something that you've learned <laughs> as you've been scoping your project or as you've been working with your stakeholders. Um, that way, maybe we can all uh, learn from each other's uh, learnings. And let's see, uh, see if anyone's popping anything in the chat. Oh, hello. Sounds like people are in colder places right now. Maybe not everybody. Okay, I see Atlanta. That's likely not as cold. Um, I will say that here in Santa Monica, it has, it has been quite chilly for the last um, maybe five or six weeks, and we've had a lot of rain in the last two weeks, which is not something you expect to hear for Los Angeles, but uh, we desperately need the rain, so I'm glad for it. So has anyone um, got any <laughs> uh, learnings to share already from their experience of scoping their project? Uh, coming up with the design? Have you noticed it being different from uh, how you typically design a research project in academia? I'd really love to hear oh, what you guys are coming across. Let's see. Oh, no, nobody's popping anything in the chat. Oh, do we have anything? Okay. Uh, oh, yes. Stakeholders don't always know what's best, but you support their desires by trying to persuade with data, even though it's always, uh, it, it isn't always successful. Yes, that's very correct. Um, definitely a, a time to leverage your expertise because you would be working with people who aren't necessarily researchers. It, most likely they aren't researchers. Um, and then try to bring them along on the journey. Uh, some people will require more convincing than others for sure. Um, and it, it sort of depends on how mature the UX is at a particular organization. Uh, they may know that you're the person to bring them the answers and then place all their trust in you as well. So you can have very different experiences just depending on who you work with. Uh, much more focused. Yep, definitely. Um, sometimes in academia, when we run a survey, for example, we include uh, many different measures of variables for convergent or divergent validity. Uh, whereas in uh, industry, you are typically only going in for exactly the variables that you think that you're going to need, uh, partly because of um, participant time, because uh, you can only uh, keep their attention for a few minutes times, um, but also so that you just gather specifically the, the data and the answers that you're looking for. So it can be a lot more targeted than what we're used to doing in academia. Um, yep, exactly. Um, and does anyone else have any other learnings uh, to share or just um, anything to share about uh, their experiences speaking with um, stakeholders? Janine, did I accidentally close something that was for the admin? I had I saw a pop up and I just closed it without reading it. Um, I don't think so. Okay. I, okay. Yeah, I think we're good. Thanks. All right. No worries. Then I'm going to move this over here so that I can see who's participating um, on my other screen and also my, uh, my slides. So, uh, okay. All right. So let's move forward. I think uh, we've given some people time to get in. Over here. Uh, today's agenda. Um, I'm actually going to skip the recap of session two because we do provide you with uh, the recordings in the deck um, already. And today's session is going to be pretty dense, I think. Um, I would like to ask if anyone um, has any questions about the resources that are uh, currently available in the Slack community. Um, since the last session, I have added a tooling comparison. Um, I've uh, filled out, I think the most requested 
topics a little bit more um, and also provided uh, samples of what research plans, uh, screeners, and moderation guides might look like, as well as uh, some templates. Uh, some templates were from me. They're just based on uh, work that I've done at TikTok and Meta, just to be clear, not the actual work, but the types of information that we include in um, those documents. Um, and I also included templates uh, from another researcher who had published them on their website because I thought those were also helpful just to give you some basis for comparison of what different templates might look like. Um, yeah, uh, so please feel free to drop questions in the chat or um, come off of mute if you would like uh, and just uh, let me know uh, if I can answer questions. Um, if there's any clarification necessary, or if there were resources that you really needed, uh, and then I didn't think to provide them for you, because I will try to do that afterwards. Let's see. Okay. Um, Brittany, you're new to Slack and still trying to figure it out. Uh, no problem at all. Uh, we have resources in multiple channels. Um, do you happen to know which channel you're already in? Or? Yes. Uh, um, I'm in F-A-H-U-1. Mm -hmm. I don't see the F-A-H-U-2. You may have to add yourself to them. Um, when you search in the search bar, if you just type in uh, F-A-H-U, uh, do you see other channels come up for you? Um, yes, I'm seeing three. Oh. <laughs> Let me search FAHU2, see if that comes up. Oh, research okay. plan. See, yep, it says not a member. So. Huh. And you're not Wait. able to join it yourself? Nope, I can join now. <laughs> okay. Thank there you. are some other channels. Um, hmm, I wish I had put a screenshot of uh, what the channels look like now. But um, we have channels for each of the sessions, uh, the ones that have passed as well as the ones coming up. We have a intro and networking channel. We have a FAQ and resources channel. That's where a lot of the resources are gonna be. Um, they, they should all have a FAHU in the channel name. Um, and then I believe there's an intro networking channel for FAHU and a, a noteworthy events channel. Okay. So I'm providing resources and, and posts uh, in most of these channels. They should be pinned at the top, but if you're using mobile, um, you might have to click on, I think, the name of the channel and then uh, scroll down and it'll show you bookmarks and pins uh, for that particular channel. Okay. Yeah. Well, if, you have trouble, if anybody has trouble finding them, um, let me try to, uh, after the session, grab a screenshot of what it looks like, what the names of the different channels are, and then um, post them in this deck so that you can try actually searching for them too. But I, I would think that FAHU would, would give you um, all of the channels. I think I believe that there are currently seven channels, if I'm not miscounting. Uh, okay, let's see. Logan, tooling comparison dog is really helpful. Great to hear. Um, and definitely uh, share feedback if you found other tools that uh, are not on there that you think are really great and everybody else should know about them, please share uh, so that we can all learn from that. Okay, um, and some people don't see any channels. Uh, would, if you search for them in the top uh, of the Slack screen, I think there's a search bar. Um, if you search F-A-H-U, uh, do it. Does anything come up for you guys? Just let me know. Okay, great. Um, hover over the word channels uh, and then click the plus sign on the right to add and join other channels. Okay, uh, that's very helpful since I don't have it pulled up on my screen. And oh, okay, uh, Megan, thank you for sharing a screenshot. Hopefully everybody can have a look at what the different names are and that'll help you either find them or search them more, <laughs> more easily. Okay, this is great. I appreciate this. Okay, I'm gonna minimize this. Um, and maybe that helps answer my question in the evaluation survey that you guys will be filling out for me at the end as to uh, why the community seems to be a little underutilized. I wasn't sure why people weren't using it. So uh, 
if this was the problem, um, it's good to know. Hopefully we can get everybody to the right place. Um, today, we will also be talking about uh, recruiting and screening and different tips for uh, the various methodologies that you might be using, um, your lingering project blockers, and the things that you have to do before session four. So let me just pop back up and make sure there aren't any more questions about the resources. Uh, and please, you know, don't be shy about using the Slack community. Uh, definitely drop in and ask questions, um, talk to each other. Uh, this community was just really intended to be um, a safe space for all of us to learn. Uh, and I also imagined that about 95% of the information for this workshop would actually live uh, on the Slack community so that people could access it um, async and uh, just essentially like ask for what they need and then I would try to provide. So please do make use of it. All right, uh, let's go ahead and move forward. So we're going to recap, but um, by, it, is, it is linked, uh, the previous session and deck are linked here in case you haven't uh, found it. Um, I am going to go ahead and deploy some uh, quick polls to take a pulse of what's happening, what you guys need from me. Um, so you guys will see momentarily uh, this pop up on the screen. Uh, two questions about what methods you'll use in your portfolio project. Um, this will help me understand what I should focus more time on today and um, to what extent you're already familiar with the, the methods that you chose, uh, especially if you're very unfamiliar with the methods. I'll, I'll try to spend more time on them. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and launch these two questions and uh, just respond, um, take a moment to respond. And I'll sit here and wait. Let me just check. And thank you, Janine. Janine has also just shared a invite to the Slack channel for anyone who um, has not joined up until now. Never too late. You're missing out on resources, though. <laughs> so definitely uh, get on the community so that you can take advantage of everything, um, the answers that I'm trying to provide. And, um, best practices resources that I'm sharing. Has everybody had a chance to respond? Let's see. I think I see eight people have answered, but we have 16 people on the call. So there might be a few more people who are still thinking. So I'll just give you guys about. <laughs> um, there is a typo that I just saw. It's not dairy study, it is diary study, by the way. Sorry, that's my fault. <laughs> We are still waiting for a few more participants, but let me see what's popping up already. It looks like, oh, are you guys able to see this? Let me move this over. Um, it looks like surveys and moderated interviews are the most, uh, the ones that are going to be most used among this group. Um, okay. Got a few people fielding diary studies and card sorts, a few people fielding unmoderated interviews. And not everyone's using a screener, so that's interesting to hear. And I, I'm guessing that maybe because um, you have very specific uh, users that you're going to be working with. So there, it's kind of like a captive audience that's already available to you. Um, but if you do recruit through uh, websites like user testing or user interviews or user Zoom, where um, you're drawing from their large pool of panelists, um, you definitely will want to employ a screener because uh, on websites like those, um, people are just motivated to get into a study so they can earn money. So you want to make sure that they, they do actually fit uh, the qualifications for your study. Something else, okay. So this is um, good for me to learn as well. Um, 
what methodologies are you guys using that I may not have covered here? Because it, uh, it looks like I won't be able to cover them in today's session. I didn't prepare for that. But if I can um, find some resources for you, I'm happy to add them to the deck um, after this session. Uh, so feel free to either drop that in the chat or just mention right now, um, if you want to come off of mute, uh, what you might be using that I didn't think about. Anybody? Hi. Hi, Helen. Hi, everybody. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Um, net, net, net ethnography or netography. Oh, okay. Mm, yeah, that one's new to me. Yeah, I mean, um, what I'm going to do for my portfolio, and I, I didn't. Um, December was hectic. I, uh, I didn't. I haven't started it yet. Um, but I started some Facebook groups before, and um, it's for a digital nomad app. So I started some. Groups. Plus, there's tons of digital nomad Facebook groups, and everyone's always posting questions like, "Where's the plus, best place to eat?" or "Where's the best? Mm. Place? How much does it cost to live there?" So, okay. I want to, um, yeah, do a thematic analysis of, of the types of questions that are being asked. Yeah. Okay. Kind of uh, inform on what features. Um, but I also wanted to ask about. Um, I mean, some of these groups are private. Mm -hmm. Is it fine to like? Um, do like anonymous and aggregate um, analysis of what people are saying, or are there kind of ethical issues that would come up if I were, were doing this for a corporate? That's a really good question. Usually, uh, I would I would defer to your company's um, legal and privacy teams for something like that, but you may be uh, part of a company that is so small that there is no legal and privacy team, in, in which case I just to be safe, you might want to consult a lawyer just to be perfectly safe. But I, I would say that as long as um, everything is anonymous and you're pulling questions, like general themes, that's that's probably safe enough. But yeah. I am not a lawyer. So uh, again, you, you may want to ask um, somebody with some legal expertise about this. Uh, if I were doing this in the context of uh, something more corporate, um, then typically my research would, would go through uh, legal and privacy review anyway. So they would uh, they would point out any concerns at that point. Okay. Like, I, I feel like if, if their names are not being named, if there's no PII, uh, and you're just kind of like, uh, you know, clustering, similar topics, um, there shouldn't be anything identifiable coming out of these groups. Okay, so I guess for my portfolio like presentation, as long as I say that I've considered these issues, that should be fine. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, I think maybe you could mention that um, if you were in the context of uh, a corporate environment, you would defer to um, anything that legal and privacy teams uh, raise for you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Other, that was yeah. a great question. That was really interesting. Yeah. The other one I have is um, I don't know what kind of sample size to use or how long to spend on it. My my, I guess I would do a pilot study and kind of see how long it takes me to get through whatever, like um, you know, a certain number of months or years of. Yeah, I guess just determining sample size. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. There's oh. so many different Facebook groups and there's so many different forums and yeah. So right. I guess until I start seeing saturation in in the in the themes, or um, that would be a good guideline. Saturation in themes, uh, and then also as the person who's designing the study, you can kind of decide the scope too. For example, um, if you were uh, actually working on this app, uh, is this the only user research that you would ever conduct, or is this going to be iterative? Would you um, do some follow-up studies in the future where you could grab more questions uh, as needed? But for like an MVP, your uh, minimal viable product, um, sometimes you just want like the 20 most common questions perhaps. And that's something for the engineers to start uh, building on. And then as the app grows and you get more membership, you can start taking submitted questions from the people who actually use it um, or even go out and uh, pull more questions out of new, new groups. Okay. I mean, for the purpose of the portfolio project, should I give myself like a, a timeline of like three weeks or something to do the interviews and the net ethnography and design a survey? Or yeah, I guess just... Um, coming hmm. up the timeline? Uh, hmm, that's a good question. I feel like this is something we should dive a little bit more deeper 
into perhaps in the Slack community, if you wouldn't mind. That way we can kind of like think it through and I can maybe ask you some questions uh, and then kind of plot out something. Um, but scoping, you know, definitely sometimes depends on uh, what time you have available. Uh, so that was something that we might want to take into account as well uh, if you're already working full time and then the time that's remaining um, until uh, you have to start analyzing the data. So you yourself know how much time you have available to complete these tasks and how long it would take you to complete these tasks. That That's probably going to be the main thing guiding um, how much time you should spend on it. Okay, thanks for that feedback. Yeah, that's that... but please do um, jump in the Slack community so we can work on this a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail. Okay, thanks, Helen. Of course, of course. Okay, um, and I'm just kind of like glancing. Oops. Do you do you want me to end the poll? I am. Um... I'm just looking at the final one. Okay. <laughs> I didn't okay. have a chance to take a look. Okay, very familiar, somewhat familiar, and familiar with some methods, maybe unfamiliar with others. Okay, all right, so. Hopefully, maybe I can spend more time answering um, your questions then, rather than going through uh, a lot of my slides in great detail. Uh, I was worried that some people may be using uh, methods that are completely unfamiliar to them. Um, and so I tried to give a lot of detail uh, in my slides, but let's see. I, think I won't share the results since you guys were able to see them already. Uh, let's go ahead and move forward. Um, so considering that you guys are using surveys and uh, not very many people are screening, um, could I could I actually hear some reasons for why you may not need to screen? I just want to um, see what the possible reasons are. But it, I, my guess was that you have um, a set of users already that you would be interviewing or surveying. And thank you, Michelle, for sharing the doc. I think that's probably the tooling doc. Sorry. Okay, target users. All right. Same here, I have target uh, users. And um, my only um, question is, I haven't started talking to the users yet. And I think when I talk to them, I'm gonna ask them for other recommendations for people to reach out to, because I want to include not only people that already use the system that I'm researching, but also people who aren't using it and find out why. So mm -hmm. that, that might be more tricky to find those type of people. Right. Um, this is something that I would like to chat a little bit more about uh, because it sounds like you'll have to recruit outside of the organization or outside of that pool of target users. Um, are you using any participant panel or pool, like through user testing or um, any of the uh, tools that um, I've seen? I'm not. I didn't think that that, I didn't want to spend money, to be frank. <laughs> I assume that I have to spend money for those. Right. Um, and, and my research is about a system that I actually use for my job. Mm -hmm. um, because I work in a library IT department, and we use a ticketing system. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. And so I'm targeting users within the library that are putting in the tickets. But I also know that there are, uh, you know, libraries being a service oriented industry, there are users that come to them that, um, you know, oh. that's why they put in the ticket is on behalf of somebody else oh. who, who isn't even aware of the ticketing system. So I think that's what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to get at people who come to um, a library person and ask them a question and need help mm -hmm. and find out if there's a way we could better serve them with the ticketing system or in some other way. Okay. Um, could you potentially reach them? I, I don't know how these library users are normally reached mm -hmm. through text messages or emails, but um, 
send out some type of uh, recruitment message and screener, um, mm -hmm. just looking to see if they've re ever requested help from the help desk. Uh, but of course, kind of hiding that amongst um, other distractor items. Yeah, that's a really great suggestion. Um, yeah, we do have like a chat feature on our library homepage. And, mm -hmm. and in many cases, we have kept a history of people who contacted us that way. So I could ask, I could reach out and ask for that list. of people. Mm -hmm. That's a really great suggestion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I guess normally they might uh, have to consent to being recruited for research, but I think for a one time only sort of situation, again, maybe talk to the library and see if they have any uh, mm -hmm. sort of legal or privacy protections um, around that. Um, you know, don't be annoying, of course, send one recruitment message and if they don't respond, then don't send any more. Um, in that case, it'd probably be more helpful to offer an incentive, whereas with my fellow library employees, I wasn't planning on offering an mm -hmm. incentive, is that right? Um, if possible, yes, some, some type of incentive, it doesn't, uh, I, I think actually, According uh, to some thought leaders, we like to just call it compensation since it's uh, really to compensate them for their time and it's not okay. Okay. an incentive. But this is something I learned recently. Um, you could uh, refer to some type of compensation or uh, if there is some type of benefit that the library can offer them. Well, we already offer free books. <laughs> but yeah, no, I know what you're saying. Let's see, Helen, you, we can't hear you. You can't hear me? Oh, now we can. You froze for a bit, but we, so we couldn't hear you talking for about the last 30 seconds. Oh gosh, okay, uh, apologies. Um, gosh, I don't know if there's something wrong with my internet, but I unfortunately don't have a way to change that. Uh, I, I just said, uh, you know, to increase trust uh, and know that people, um, l let people know that you really do value uh, whatever feedback you're, they're able to give. Um, just, to, I, I guess, uh, <laughs> making that offer of compensation or some type of, yeah, it's giving them something for their time uh, is generally one of the best practices uh, nowadays. Okay, um, so I think that makes sense that that you guys are using um, target users. Uh, and I guess you already know that these are the target users, uh, so there's not really a need, a need to screen for them. Um, I believe that makes sense for sure. Uh, let's see. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. Um, all of this information is going to stay in the deck. So please feel free to come back to it uh, if I have to skip over something for the sake of time. Um, and again, I'm very open to answering questions in the Slack community. So just uh, you know, take a screenshot or just like mention it and say, you know, Helen, what did you mean by this if I didn't clarify enough? I tried to go into more detail on my slides because we have a number of people who have asked uh, me to make this as um, async friendly as possible for people who are in different time zones and cannot attend live. So let's see, I will move forward. Um, <laughs> this is an example of a screener, but it sounds like because most people are not using screeners, I won't spend a lot of time on this. I, I will just say that I was, I consulted um, with a company last year it was for a different topic. Uh, I'm under NDA, so I'm not using the actual topic here, but they showed me the screener that they were planning to use. Um, and the questions were like, have you ever ridden a bike? And then the uh, responses were yes or no. Uh, this of course cues um, or clues in the participant as to what you're interested in uh, finding out about. So if they're motivated to get into your study because they wish to be paid um, or for some other reason, they know to respond yes. So these uh, would not be ideal types of questions to ask, the ones that are so specific. 
um, it's better to hide uh, the, the target behavior of interest or the target attitude of interest uh, among others. Um, and maybe uh, make sure that it's not too obvious uh, which one you're after. For example, a better question would be, which of these have you done? Um, but if you have some rather mundane choices and then you have a very specific one that is a uh, road, a mountain bike, that might be a little too specific and would again um, clue people into the fact that that's probably the answer that you're looking for. So uh, a, a better or best uh, way to screen for this would be um, to uh, be very specific um, and really target uh, the type of person that you want instead of asking if they've ever done something, ask them if they've done it in a recent time frame. So last 30 days, last three months, if it's something that they may, might not have done a lot in the last 30 days, uh, that's so a question that maybe your stakeholders will have to answer for you, like how engaged of a user or how much of a power user uh, that person needs to be. Um, and then hide your specific response among other specific responses. And this is not necessarily the only best response so that, that there is. I think there could be multiple ways to write an excellent question um, to seek for somebody uh, that would be a target user for a mountain biking trail site. Okay, um, so let's see, I'm just gonna go ahead and move forward. But if you do have uh, screener questions or want me to look over a screener, very happy to do that. Sometimes it's just easier to give advice about uh, an, an actual question um, rather than to try to project what problems could be coming up. Um, so I think that we did have most of our attendees saying that they are potentially doing surveys uh, or unmoderated interviews. Um, and I think I saw a question about the difference between unmoderated interviews and moderated interviews. Uh, that's a great question. Let me try to touch on that very quickly. Um, an unmoderated interview, uh, these are the type of studies that you can run um, on user testing, for example, or on user Zoom, where the participant is usually being either voice recorded or video recorded, and they're going through a series of questions and responding to them. But you are not there to correct them if they go off course. Um, you are, so it's almost like a, a survey. Basically, you are not there to uh, probe them further if they don't go into enough detail or uh, redirect them if they misunderstand the question or go off course. So I've placed these two together on the screen uh, because you need a similar level of um, having the questions very well written and well defined, um, and essentially not being able to adjust things on the fly. Like uh, if you accidentally have the wrong link inserted uh, in your survey or unmoderated interview, then um, that's going to stop them in the study. They won't be able to proceed. Uh, so I think probably the most important thing to remember for anything that's unmo unmoderated is just um, triple check everything. I definitely recommend dry runs and soft launches uh, just to make sure that everything is looking good before it goes out to a larger population. Um, just as a just an example. <laughs> Just as an example, um, I have run large surveys for uh, the several companies that I've worked for, and we spend, you know, up to six figures sometimes recruiting for participants. Uh, usually we, you know, will contract with a vendor like um, Qualtrics, uh, their professional services, they have panels that they have access to, um, or... or uh, yeah, like measuring you, um, Ipsos, where we we pay them like over a hundred thousand dollars to source several thousand participants for us. And if you were to do the full launch without checking that everything is correct, that all your skip logic uh, and branching are correct, that um, your links go where they're supposed to go, uh, that could be a very expensive mistake. Not only does it cost you time, but it literally will cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. So be very careful. Um, thankfully, when you work with vendors like those, they also have those uh, safety cushions built in to where um, they will double check your logic for you. Uh, and they will usually suggest, hey, let's do a soft launch with 100 people, see how it goes. Uh, do you want to change anything? And then uh, roll out um, to everybody. Uh, 
I have also, before my transition to UX, participated in over a thousand UX research projects uh, as a participant. Um, and I would say, I think the most common mistake that I noticed, uh, unfortunately, was broken links. Either they put um, the same link when there were supposed to be different links, maybe they were duplicating the question and just like altering uh, like, you know, certain words in this um, sentence to tap different dimensions, um, but then they forgot to change the link to the new one. Or um, they used a link where uh, it was like an internal link. It wasn't the share link um, that outside people can see. So as a person who was not logged into their Figma or to their um, Google Doc, uh, I couldn't see what it was they want me to, wanted me to work on. Um, and uh, it's it's very easy to forget this. I think uh, you can be a pro. And if you're just rushing, um, if someone gives you a doc at the last minute, you may for, forget to get uh, the correct link. So it happens to the best of us, unfortunately, but um, watch out for that. And let's see, I don't know if anyone is feeling with mobile uh, or feeling with video on mobile. This is more likely to happen if you're using something like dscout, but uh, just, make sure that the recording is going to be the best it's going to be because uh, that will be your your main data. Okay, I saw that the second most used methodology among this group uh, was going to be interviews. Um, so these are moderated interviews. Uh, this is what I currently do the most. Um, so I probably have a little bit more advice on this. Let me see. We'll just try to hit the, the main points um, since we are running low on time. Uh, again, do a dry run or soft launch just to be uh, just to be sure that everything that is working as it's supposed to work. Um, and usually the most ideal scenario when running uh, interviews is you have somebody note taking for you somebody who's trained to note-take, uh, so ideally another researcher, or uh, you're recording the session and then you'll go back later um, and take notes from your session. So that way you can focus entirely on um, the person watching their expressions and their like nonverbal cues uh, and just knowing um, when to probe instead of having to note-take and uh, watch the participant at the same time. But I will say that sometimes you just don't have this most ideal scenario and you may be the person doing the note taking while you're interviewing the participant. And that absolutely happens as well. So if you have to do that, uh, that's actually probably the most common thing that I do uh, because there isn't always a stakeholder available um, at the times that I'm interviewing. Uh, most researchers are usually working on their own projects. So you don't necessarily have somebody else to note take for you. Um, but all of these are possible just to let you know. Um, I really recommend this uh, debrief time after the first one or two participants. Um, and this is just uh, like setting aside an hour or so right after those first couple of participants to um, see how much of the questions you got through, uh, maybe throw out some, uh, or just like deprioritize a few of them and uh, maybe reword questions that the participants seem to find confusing. And that way, um, when you go in for the rest of your uh, interviews, you just have a much more streamlined set of questions um, and kind of know where to hit. Uh, and then you can go back to the less, um, the low priority questions if there's time. Can you guys hear me? I'm getting another internet connection is unstable. Okay, all right. Um, all right, I... We'll also move on to the second screen because I have some common mistakes listed here. Um, if there's anything that the participants need to prepare ahead of time, if they need to have their phone charged because they're going to also screen share from their phone, you know, remind them of that. Unfortunately, sometimes they. All right, you froze it again. All right. Um... So maybe we could just kind of look over, um, yeah, what she says here um, about um, being hey, able Esther. to. Okay, you just you just disappeared for thirty seconds. The last 20, 30 seconds again. Oh no! <laughs> I don't know.
know what's happening. I am so sorry, guys. That's uh, okay. I will look into this, but uh, I we have like the best internet that I have available in my area, and I don't seem to be in control of it. I'll look into this. Uh, but I was just going after uh, going over how important it is to have uh, the necessary software. Just remind them to um, charge their phones if you're going to be having them screen share from mobile, um, and you know uh, to even have their laptop charger uh, nearby because that's also happened during interviews where uh, they they weren't plugged in, um, and then they had to stop in the middle middle of the interview to uh, find their adapter and plug in. Um, Icebreaker is something that I would absolutely keep. Uh, it helps establish um, that rapport and trust in you. Uh, it's also a good way to gauge uh, how quickly that participant speaks. Um, because if you have a participant who tends to speak a little bit more slowly, um, you just know that you're either going to have to cut them short sometimes uh, to get through all the questions, um, or you may have to focus on the most essential questions uh, that are in your moderation guide. Um, and this is, a, this is pretty important, I guess. Um, it will vary depending on how much you need to speak in your script, but just expect to spend like 75% at least uh, of the session being the listener. Uh, you most likely will not be talking quite so much except to ask questions uh, and maybe summarize or clarify things that they say. Um, and I think I've explained this on the deck. So I will go ahead and move forward. I wanna leave some time for questions. We do have a few people who are doing card sorts. Um, I have done a few card sorts. So I was able to share a few tips here. Uh, if possible, conduct the card sorts in person or with screen share recording. Um, and then this allows participants to um, think out loud as they sort the cards. This is really where your insights are going to come from. Um, absolutely, after the session, you know, you'll run the analysis to see like how they're grouping the cards together. But uh, it's also important to know why uh, they've chosen to group them a certain way because people may group cards similarly but not have the same reason for doing so. Um, let's see. And I, I just tend to advocate for any like caution um, to make things easy for them, have them review the cards to make sure that they're happy with where they've placed um, the cards under each category. And uh, if you are going to ask questions about specific cards, uh, let them leave those cards up on the screen so that they can refer back to the exact ones um, instead of trying to recall them from their memory. Okay, and if for some reason you are running your card sort uh, as an unmoderated study, uh, which means you won't be there to answer any questions or um, clarify things uh, or give examples, uh, then doubly make sure that uh, the text is an, uh, as clear as possible um, and that if examples are necessary that you go ahead and give them um, either on the card or on uh, the place where you can like mouse over where they can see examples. Um, I believe Optimal Workshop definitely allows that. And I think, I think that both user testing and user Zoom allow for uh, mousing over to get additional information. And if you're doing like uh, paper and pencil, like card sorts, um, then that's probably something that you're moderating in person anyway. Okay, diary studies. Um, hmm. Okay, very quickly because we are running out of time. Uh, I guess the most important thing here is to keep the tasks very clear. Um, I wouldn't. I probably would not run a, a, study, a diary study that's more than eight to ten days. Uh, long just because there's going to be a lot of uh, attrition um, unless you have depending on the organization or the platform that you're working on if the, you just have highly invested users uh, who are just engaged and willing to do something for longer like um, if it's your department uh, at your, your university and those people are just um, basically a captive audience they're available for you all the time uh, then you could potentially do a, a longer study. 
but in industry, I, I would say very likely that you would only run for up to 10 days. Um, after that, there'd be a lot of drop off um, and they should be compensated uh, accordingly. Mm, and if the questions were perhaps uh, not as thorough as you liked and you, you heard some interesting insights, but they didn't quite go into detail, um, you can certainly in, in consider inviting the uh, insightful participants or participants with very different points of view to come back for uh, post-study interviews um, so that you can dive a little deeper um, into things that they only touched on in their diaries. And I think uh, really just monitoring data as it comes in, whether whether it's like a uh, soft launch, a dry run, or just um, data that, that are coming in uh, on a daily basis, um, you know, do your due diligence and just like uh, monitor uh, data as they come in to see if there's anything unclear, if um, instructions were not followed, uh, so that you can try to correct it as quickly as possible. Okay, um, so I know that among us, Helen, yes? uh, Nicole had a question about the diary study. It's in the chat. Oh, sure. Let me have a look. Okay, how much writing or recording do you expect participants to write in a diary study, like a paragraph or one or two pages? Um, definitely much shorter than that. Uh, so the type of diary studies that we usually run or, or that I have, I've usually run in academia have um, almost always been uh, multiple choice with maybe short answers. Um, and you can think of a diary study as almost just being like, uh, this is how I've explained it to non-researchers. Um, it's like a variable that you track uh, on a daily or regular basis. So like if people have kept a calorie counter or food diary, um, or if they track the number of steps that they walk every day, that's a, a form of a diary study. So it can be, it can be very lightweight. Uh, and for them to follow through, you do want to make it as simple as possible. So I would say um, for a daily diary, maybe something that takes no more than 10, 15 minutes. Uh, maybe the initial uh, onboarding questions can be a little bit longer because you're trying to understand uh, you know, where they're coming from um, and who that particular person is and what POV they're providing in your study. And then the wrap up, uh, diary could also be a little longer just to have them reflect back on everything that they've uh, experienced during the course of the week or so. But for the, the really daily uh, measures, it would be maybe just a set of multiple choice questions and then uh, a couple of short answer or one longer open response. Looks like she froze again. Does anybody have any experience with it? Oh, it's usually like four or five sentences. Yeah, we you you froze again for about twenty seconds. Oh no, so. <laughs> that is so strange. Um, I'm not sure what's happening, and I really apologize for that. I guess I might have to find a, a different source of internet. But okay. Um, yep. I, I hope that I was able to clarify that. And let me see, uh, since we really do have very little time left, I was hoping uh, to have all of you guys, uh, since you are also seasoned researchers, to share your tips and mistakes to avoid um, during surveys and uh, interviews or anything that, any methodology that you're used to using. But I think uh, maybe we can start a thread uh, about this on Slack and then people can contribute async. Uh, and that way we can get to the end of these slides. Okay, uh, I said this during the last session, during session two, but this is really, really important. Uh, document everything as you go. Uh, you can forget so quickly um, when it comes time to put together your portfolio and then uh, when you're answering questions in the job interviews uh, about the whole process, what happened. So keep track of uh, speed or like, I guess, yeah, road bumps that you hit um, where you end up having to pivot or um, completely change what you're doing uh, and your thought process for what you end up deciding to do. 
um, it helps show your adaptability and then they want to see like your reasoning and the thought process for uh, how you adjust um, to uh, times when you have to swerve. Um, and also just to document like the questions that your stakeholders are asking you um, and how you respond to them. Uh, because in job interviews, you will often be asked uh, like, how did you manage this particular situation? Uh, with a stakeholder or with somebody that you were collaborating with. And if you have um, these examples already written down, then it's very easy to just go back and remember what the situation was um, and how you responded to it. Your audio just dropped again or along the way. And then how did you get the stakeholders to see uh, see things your way or how did you manage them? How did you bring them along for this ride? Uh, I, I, see, I think that ultimately is the most important in a job getting context. So your portfolio is kind of like showcasing what uh, skills you're bringing to the table uh, and being able to collaborate well with your team and manage your stakeholders uh, is one of those big skills. And then um, getting their buy-in uh, is another big skill for a researcher to have. Okay, um, so I'm afraid we don't have a whole lot of uh, time left, but I am willing to stay on the call if anybody wants to um, bring up their specific materials to ask questions. And um, I will go ahead and just gloss over the slides that are left here um, and then come back to any questions that we have. So January, um, this is your month for recruiting, screening, fielding, um, getting that data in. Uh, please continue communicating with me. Um, I prefer on Slack just so that we can learn from each other. Um, uh, just let me know if you're uh, running into any problems along the way. If you have any questions that come up, uh, happy to try to respond as quickly as possible and provide resources uh, as necessary. And um, this is just uh, what you'd like to have done for the next session. So there is a midpoint event. Perhaps you just look over the slide as we're waiting for her to come back. Um, Am I frozen again? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what's happening. So I just keep refer keep referring him back to the slide. So <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know what's happening. There's nobody else using my internet. Um, so for this poll question, uh, please respond with one of the options. I know it says multiple choice there, but just please respond with one of the options. Um, and this is for the sake of scheduling the recruiter and hiring manager who are gonna come in to review your um, case study. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how much time to give them to review uh, your project before they actually come in. Okay, I'll give you guys time to respond to that. Um, And I think, as I mentioned earlier, you will definitely run into problems. You'll definitely have fails, but that's absolutely to be ex expected. I think in my entire history of doing research, I don't think I've ever seen a project go completely perfectly where all the participants were perfect and all the data were ex just like uh, <laughs> exactly what I wanted. Um, so, you know, uh, it's going to happen. Keep track of it. Uh, again, very important for the context of your portfolio and uh, definitely things that you can um, leverage into your in your interview to show uh, how you overcame them. All right, and I think, yes, everybody appears to have answered. So it does look like we will have a good number of people who are very likely to submit um, and some people who are not sure yet, but that's fine. I will go ahead and account for that number. Okay, and everything else here. Um, these slides are still here just in case you guys need uh, links to anything. Um, 
And uh, please do share on Slack when your study kicks off so that we can all celebrate with you. And I will go ahead and take any questions now. I'm happy to stay on a little bit uh, later for, for anybody who wants to either um, show something that you might be uh, struggling with or just talk it through verbally as well. Uh, let me pop in the chat and see if anyone has mentioned. Okay. And Megan, you said, would it be possible? Okay. Um, do you mind me reading this out loud? I think everybody can see it. Uh, would it be possible to ask this again, say in mid-February, because you're unsure what your semester uh, will be like? Yes, absolutely. I'll, I'll definitely check in um, again as uh, our timeline moves forward. Um, this is just to give me a general idea of how many people um, I need supporting uh, the review session, because uh, maybe the recruiter would like to have a buddy uh, on board or um, they might ask for two weeks to review the projects instead of just one week, uh, depending on their needs. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, did anyone have questions? You can unmute uh, and come on uh, the screen if you want, or if you need to share screens for any reason, that's fine too. Um, or... I have a random specific ish question okay so, so like based in my experience and like what i know of survey methodology like check all that apply questions can be problematic because you don't know if data is missing because they it doesn't apply or they just skipped it so in my experience i've always transitioned those into like yes no matrix so that mm -hmm. they respond to each item individually is that still relevant within like ux or do they prefer that check all that apply because like in my experience the yes no matrix so instead of like how have you heard about our project check all that apply you would change it to you know indicate for each if you've heard about our product facebook i, I don't know email, right. whatever and then it's very clear like whether they skip the answer or not but in some of the examples i see it seems like the check all that apply are used more often i don't know if that's just from like habit or like whether like, yeah. It's a good question. Um, and there may be different reasons uh, that somebody chooses to use those check all that apply over a, a matrix that asks individually about each point. Um, sometimes it's just time. Uh, if you have a very dense survey where you're expecting to have a lot of those types of questions, you might just put the less important ones as a uh, check all that apply so that they can get past that really quickly and then focus a little bit more um, on the matrix type questions. I, I tend to include both types, um, again, just depending on how important that particular question is. Uh, and I wonder if there's any other reason that people might do that. I, I would say it, it is mostly related uh, specifically to keeping it a, a low lift or less heavy lift for the participants. Um, just because sometimes you really can't keep their attention for much longer. I would say um, every industry survey that I've run has taken 10 minutes tops. That's how long they spend on it. Um, I, when I was at uh, some previous employers um, and we ran surveys, So your audio cut out. And it's just sometimes uh, what you think the users are. I'm probably frozen again. You, you cut know. out. You cut <laughs> out again. <laughs> this is not a good sign. Um, and it has never happened this much. I know it's weird. The issue is, but I'll look into that for next time. Uh, okay, we'll it. Um, it was just a more curiosity thing because all from like my experience, like it's typically better to do the yes no matrix because it makes it where they can process one item at a time and mm -hmm. you know clearly whether it's really missing or they mm -hmm. like select it now. But. Right, right. Yes, um, I would say if, if that is one of your key questions, um, go ahead and use these matrix or these scale matrices. Um, but it, it really just depends on how long you can keep that participant because if they drop off because it's just too many questions to answer, um, then you're also missing their entire data as well. So it's a trade off. 
Thanks. Of course, of course. Um, any other questions? I think something was in the chat. Should I pop in there? Oh, it popped off. I am so sorry, guys. I do not know what the internet issue is, and it doesn't normally happen. So I will have to look into what's going on. It may be something that's happening today. I think I saw somebody suggest earlier, was that Liz, uh, about restarting the computer. So um, I did actually restart the computer uh, last night. So I don't know if I installed something <laughs> that, that broke it or what, but we'll try to find out what the issue is. Um, any other questions? And please feel free to reach out to me um, on Slack. Uh, you can you can definitely uh, message me on LinkedIn if you want. I sort of prefer to contain everything on the Slack community, um, partly because it's all in one place and I don't miss anything, but also so other people can learn potentially from your question and answer. Uh, I've got a question. Right yep. now, I don't really have any stakeholders. I mean, I've got potential collaborators. There's someone <laughs> I talked to in India that's got a, a software company or um, like a he's a developer and he's got a company. Right. Um, and one of the Facebook groups I started in Thailand, it's um, it's pretty active right now. And there's uh, one guy's doing his PhD on digital nomads. Mm -hmm. So he's potentially, and he, 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 like he's, he'd be great at writing content because he, he's always writing his own posts on his Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And another um, Thai lady that's organizing all these meetups, like co-working meetups. Right. Um, and then there's someone else in Singapore that I talked to that's, that does like digital nomads Bali. But I was, but the, like I have potential collaborators, but no real stakeholders. Um, I don't know if I should, for the purposes of having a strong portfolio project, like mm -hmm. get them, see if I can get them on board. Or if I could chime in um, regarding this, there are several groups called Wi Fi Tribe in various digital nomads businesses that rent space to people, maybe look into those maybe they would be interested to you know in your research and oh, your... Like, um, like different um co-working spaces uh yes but uh, yes but all over the world they have um um they actually more than co-working spaces they rent um space and organize activities and sort of function um as a kind of overlooking everything entity as a airbnb you know airbnb sort of manage relationship between renter and um owner the same they do the same they vet people who go into this digital tribes and so on oh okay i know that there's one company called remote year so, so see, there. there's already several because I, I run on at least five, like all like remote, nomad, one was Wi-Fi tribe and so on. So you might want to check, you know, Google this and, and probably some other people would know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm actually thinking that if, if um, like there's a startup place called Antler in Toronto and I've been randomly, I'm teaching, um, I'm the TA on a, or supervising a course on on startups. So um, someone reached out to me in Antler in October if I wanted to apply and I missed an email, but they said I could apply again in February. So I'm kind of, you know, I'll do this as a portfolio project, but there's also in my head that this could potentially be an app. Um, so I'm not sure if I'd want to collaborate with somebody that might end up being an indirect competitor. I'm not sure. Uh, Liz, I remember um, when you first mentioned this potential uh, project, um, I think I may have said uh, that the scope of this is quite large um, and you might want to focus on a very narrow aspect of it um, just for the uh, purposes of this workshop. Um, since you, you do only have approximately four or five weeks to conduct the research. And obviously you can do any follow-up research that you like uh, if you do actually create this app. But uh, if you are pl planning on having somebody design this for you, uh, then you would have- I do uh, actually have a stakeholders. A friend of mine, she was supposed to actually do like the landing page and she's a She's a web designer and a, a UX designer. Mm -hmm. So I do actually have a stakeholder. She just kind of dropped off the map. I've got to follow up with her. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, 
I would say this is kind of a unique situation in that when you when you start interviewing, when people are looking at your portfolio, they are going to want to see that you are working with somebody uh, since that's uh, one of the key skills, I think, when working in industry. Uh, otherwise, it's almost just like a thought experiment, really, that you're doing with yourself. Because uh, we could all certainly conduct um, generative research about a, a topic that we're interested in and turn it into, you know, a website or an app uh, in the future. But that's not quite so much uh, the situation that you would be in if you were employed by a company where they either have an existing product or a product that they're planning to build. Um, so I would suggest uh, e either uh, reconnecting with the UX designer who was potentially going to design a landing page for you um, and, and just make that the scope of this workshop project. Um, I, of course, I do hope that you eventually turn this into a full-on app in the future. Uh, but if, if you are not able to proceed with this particular line of thought, uh, you may want to look for um, something else that will, uh, that could be a three to five week project um, to run for this. Okay, so I could, I could keep it as um, designing a web page for like affiliate marketing or something, or just um, a generative project to see what, what features are most needed in, uh, in an app for digital nomads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. But I ideally do do work with at least one stakeholder uh, that will um, that will really give your portfolio project a lot more weight uh, in your portfolio and in interviews. Okay, at least one, or would it be better to have multiple? If you can have multiple, that is probably um, that's probably going to simulate uh, the most common scenario that you'd encounter in industry. Uh, most of the time, you don't only have one stakeholder. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Yeah, of course. And I understand that uh, you weren't able to work on it um, in December. It was a very busy month for uh, everyone, I suspect. So, um, you know, just roll with it. Uh, do what you can to try to get there. Um, feel free to uh, message me if you have any doubts. Maybe we can try to find um, a smaller version of this project uh, or an alternate project if you still like to submit a portfolio for review. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Of course. Um, did I have a chat question? Okay, no. Uh, Janine has shared the midpoint evaluation survey link in the chat. Um, so please do take some time to fill that out uh, so that I can improve the series for you and then also any future iterations that are run. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Otherwise, I, I will give you your time. <laughs> well, I'll let you go because we're about 11 minutes over. Thank you. This is super, super helpful, Helen, and of very course. well organized. Thank you. Um, I'm trying my best. This is the first time I've prepped this particular series. Um, and So I'm we can just email if we want to set up a quick brainstorm about our potential studies, right? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Uh, uh, I would recommend using the Slack uh, messaging so that I can keep everything in place. Um, I'm actually not so great on email. And um, I will share this deck in um, the Slack community under uh, session three, like the channel for session three uh, after the session. And also I will start a post um, in that channel so that you guys can give your great advice about fielding surveys, interviews um, and such so that we can all learn from each other. All right, let's see, make sure there aren't any more questions. Okay, all right. Absolutely, guys. It was a pleasure. Um, again, Happy New Year. Uh, and let me know, just um, keep me updated on what's going on. If you're running into problems whenever you kick off, uh, I'm very excited to celebrate that with you. I think that kicking off a new study is probably one of the most fun parts about the job. All right. Okay, bye everyone. Enjoy your weekend.